treating any diseases. If you have any sort of medical problems, make sure that you go um, see a uh, physician or somebody else and get it uh, taken care of properly. All right, so let's move on to what the talk is about. So we're talking about demyelinating optic neuritis. And just to start out with, um, optic nerve problems, in our minds we can group them um, in this way. I think it's good. So one you can just take right out from the top is this picture is of the optic nerve. So optic nerve head stuff like papilledema or um, congenital disc problems or different optic nerve head problems I think of as kind of their own um, issue. That's one kind of group. And then you have the optic nerve itself, the meat of it here, uh, going down and then you can divide up optic nerve problems into two uh, main groups. So one being, I'm just going to put a P here for neuropathy um, and the other I'm going to put here ON for optic neuritis. All right, so you can have optic neuritis or optic neuropathy. And what we're talking about is demyelinating optic neuritis. And this is the big thing in the optic neuritis category. And there's some other ones, but this is the, the major, the most common one. And then for optic neuropathy, the big one is ischemic optic neuropathy. So that's like um, um, arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Another name for that is giant cell or non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy things like that. And there are, there are also the hereditary optic neuropathies. The one I remember is Lieber hereditary optic neuropathies and the nutritional optic neuropathies. So those are some examples of optic neuropathies. And then what we're talking going to be talking about is a specific type of optic neuritis, demyelinating optic neuritis. Other optic neuritis um, problems could include things like infectious optic neuritis, para-infectious optic neuritis, and also systemic diseases can cause optic neuritis. Um, and the one to remember there is sar uh, sarcoid can cause an optic neuritis. All right, so we'll get back to what we're talking about. It was demyelinating optic neuritis. We've we've already uh, covered some of the other types of um, infectious op optic neuritis there. And then, so what our demyelination is? It's the myelinated nerves um, losing their myelin. And in the CNS, this is the oligodendrocytes. The cells are the ones um, putting the myelin on in, the, in this peripheral nervous system. It's the Schwann cells, and the things getting myelinated are axons. All right, the optic nerve is part of the CNS. So when we're talking about demyelinating optic neuritis, we want to also be thinking about what are some of the diseases and how does demyelination work um, in the CNS. And so the things we're going to associate this with are the other main areas that can get demyelinated. So the brain, so cortex, brain stem, and I put the in my head at least cerebellum, sort of in that in that group there, and then the spinal cord. So those are the three big um, areas where you can have uh, demyelination. All right, so the disease we're going to talk about primarily, or the main disease to think about, the demyelinating optic neuritis, is multiple sclerosis. This is the most um, common disease associated with this. So the way multiple sclerosis can present is typically the majority of people with a relapsing remitting course of um, multiple CNS lesions separated out over by um, space and time. So that's the tagline to remember with multiple sclerosis. Some people also present with a more um, progressive course. It doesn't have these relapsing and remitting episodes. It just kind of gets worse and worse as time goes on. And the etiology is idiopathic um, demyelinating disease of the white matter. So as we talked about, it's the axons getting demyelinated. So that's why it's um, the white matter. And it's also a disease of um, young people. It has a um, um, whole, whole lot of morbidity associated with it. So Continuing on with our multiple sclerosis, so how it, how it presents, we're going to use our framework um, from before to think about um, ways MS can present. So brainstem problems, you may have heard that you kind of remember those with the D, so just arthria, diplopia, dysmetria, dysphagia. A specific uh, one to remember is INO, so intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. That's a problem between the connection between cranial nerve um, 6 and 3, so the eye movements are disrupted. It's, it's kind of its own topic, but it's a good thing to uh, at least have heard and be familiar with. Uh, cortex problems, so um, um, weakness, paresthesia, bladder, bowel dysfunction, um, spasticity. So these are the long track type signs. They can also have spinal cord involvement, like a transverse myelitis. There's some special named um, symptoms that people can can experience, and you want to specifically ask about these when you're concerned about MS. So one's called the Utoff phenomenon. So that's a sudden worsening of symptoms with increased temperature. I think for people like us who are interested in eyes and nerves, think about it as someone who went out and went running, and then they tell you that my vision got worse, um, a lot worse when I was right running, and my, my left eye was pretty weird. So that would be consistent with an Utoff phenomenon. The temperature is higher, symptoms are, are worse. And then the other one is uh, lower mite signs. So that's electrical sensation when you have them um, flex the neck. All right. So when you're sus suspecting um, 
MS, the workup consists of uh, two main components. So one is MRI. And you're, you're looking for peri the classic uh, periventricular plaques. You can get sort of an idea of the lesion burden that the um, patient's experiencing. Um, and we'll also see how that's helpful in pro um, prognosis um, later on. And then the second big thing is doing uh, an LP. And that's, we're going to look for the, the amount of IgG relative to the total protein. So the greater than 15% be concerning for MS, and then you're also going to look for oligoclonal bands on the um, protein electrophoresis. So what an oligoclonal band is, um, I think is worth talking about. So the oligoclonal bands, what they are, are IgG, so they're immun immunoglobulin protein, and the idea is that they're um, immunoglobulins, IgG, unique to the CSF. All right, so normally you have uh, immunoglobulin floating around in your serum, but it doesn't really get into the CNS because of the um, blood-brain barrier. You don't have a lot of intrathecal um, IgG. So when you do, if you do an LP and you get IgG um, in there, you have to wonder how did it get there. So there's two ways to think about it. So one would be a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and it kind of just seeped in from outside. And the second would be is it being produced intrathecal um, production of IgG, is it unique to the IgG? And so the way you figure that out is you do um, immunofixation and protein electrophoresis. And I think this will look familiar, these um, sort of strips of paper from either a med school or undergrad, and they have some like lines on them. And you have proteins of, of different sizes on there getting separated out. And so what the idea, um, or at least the simple fight way that I understand it is, you have some unique bands, um, oligoclonal bands that are unique to the CSF um, that you don't see on the serum. So that means obviously you have to be testing serum and um, CSF to figure that out. All right, so I think that was uh, the definition of oligoclonal um, band and sort of why it's important to think about or know. Then you have this last term I want to introduce, which is CIS, clinically isolated syndrome. I think there's different classification schemes and um, ways that MS is sort of classified and diagnosed. I don't want to belabor them, but knowing about the idea of clinically isolated syndrome is important because when someone comes in to see you, like for example, with let's say isolated optic neuritis or first, their first sort of presenting thing, then you have to kind of think about what is this called and what, you know, what should we, how should we approach this? And so the way you approach it is you don't, you know, say the person has MS. At this point, you say you have a clinically isolated syndrome, you don't meet the criteria of having um, multiple lesions throughout uh, space and time, um, and optic neuritis you can think of as, as one of the clinically um, isolated syndromes. All right, so now we're going to go on to the isolated optic um, neuritis. So the way this um, presents is subacute monocular vision loss. That's the, the buzzword that would make you want to um, think about optic neuritis, and it's typically painful, and it's also just like MS, a disease of young people, you know, in their 30s, people will be having this problem coming in with you. Um, coming in to see you about it. It can be associated with positive visual phenomena like flashes of light and a frontal headache, but those aren't necessary. The main thing is that subacute monocular vision loss, especially in a young person, um, should really make you concerned about um, optic neuritis. When you look uh, and you look at the optic nerve head, you don't really see very much because this is a retro bulbar neuritis, so you don't see very much on exam. And when you're doing the visual acuity um, in fields, you'll see a decreased central field as well as um, decreased visual acuity. <laughs> So the, in terms of how optic neuritis generally um, progresses, if you have some sort of test of function of vision on here, it'll sort of go down. Maybe the person will get come into the hospital there, start getting some care. Their vision might get worse, not really do a whole, do a whole lot over the next uh, two days up to all the way um, of two weeks. And then what you see is slow pro progressive improvement over 6 to 12 months and then a plateau out and you don't know where you're, the person's going to end up. They're going to have some sort of improvement in their visual function. You don't know how much it's going to be, um, but then you think generally after about 12 months, wherever the person ended up, you know, be it here, uh, here, or here, they're probably going to have some visual deficit um, and it's not going to change much after the after the 12 month mark. So how you can treat this is with high dose steroids, which have been shown to have a shorter rec um, recovery times. They're, they're going to reach their best vision that they're going to reach quicker, um, but not necessarily with a whole lot of um, better visual outcome or necessarily any be, be, any um, better outcome. So it's sort of a plus or minus whether you necessarily do this. And there's also interferon B um, 
therapy, which possibly can decrease the risk of progressing to MS, which could be an important thing for people who have um, high-risk optic neuritis. All right, so obviously if someone's coming in and you're diagnosed or very suspicious of optic neuritis, the a big question on their mind is going to be, well, what's the chance I'm going to have MS? So the way to th think about the association with MS and optic neuritis is to remember these um, three numbers here. So 20% of people uh, with MS present with optic neuritis. About 40% all comers of people with optic neuritis go on to develop MS. As you mentioned before, the MRI is a, ba a basic part of the workup here. It's also real important for risk stratification. So if you have um, lesions suggestive MS on the MRI, your chance of going on to um, progress from an isolated optic neuritis to having um, MS is about 55%, whereas if you don't see lesions on the MRI, your risk is only 20%. And now if you take all people with MS, about 50% will have optic neuritis at some point. So about half of people at some point will be having this uh, problem. And then, um, so we've talked about demyelinating optic neuritis in terms of having MS and isolated optic neuritis, but um, there's other um, demyelinating optic neuritis um, syndromes or you can, variants you can sort of think about. I've just listed two of them. So NMO I think is a good one to at least have heard of. Neuro, uh, neuromyelitis optica. Um, so this is um, as a rough definition optic neuritis and also having some transverse myelitis. And then you could also have, there's another one that's which is um, uh, Schindler disease. Um, Schilder disease actually. And it's a uh, progressive frontal demyelitis demyelinating disease, so like one of those sort of horrible diseases that affects um, young kids and is uh, terminal. I think the age of onset is around like 10 years, um, 10 years old, and that can often present with um, initially like an optic um, neuritis type type picture. And if you're looking for um, an article to learn more about these sorts of things, I thought this was a good a good article to sort of take you in depth about um, you know not just multiple sclerosis um, but all the sort of different um, related syndromes because it seem, they seem like they're getting more parsed out and they're going to have more specific treatments um, going on into the future. All right, so um, thanks a lot for, for watching. I didn't put in my usual ending slide, um, which is to, if you enjoy this video, please um, go to 52kids.org um, and consider making a donation. Let's see if I can spell it, 52kids. Okay, so Google 52 Kids and consider making a donation, and also um, consider um, visiting uh, the Baum Foundation, B A U M, Googling that, um, making a donation there. Okay, all right, well, thanks a lot um, for, for watching, and as usual, um, you can go to Procedure Ready um, YouTube page to see uh, more similar videos like this. Thanks a lot. Bye.